So yeah, I'm Valerie Rora. I'm here to talk about the paradox of intolerant of tolerance and how it applies to tech companies today. In particular, I want to address the issue of how to support free speech uh, without su also supporting white supremacy. Uh, tough question, a lot of people are struggling with. Just a quick disclaimer before we get into this. Uh, I'm re representing only myself in Frameshift Consulting, uh, no other, other organization or person. Uh, many of the companies I talk about in this talk are my clients, but any information in this talk about them is totally from public uh, sources. I'm not using any um, private information for that. Finally, I'm not a lawyer, and this is not legal advice. So uh, talk to uh, your lawyer if you have questions about legal problems. Uh, just a so pointer to some online resources. I've put up the slides and some various related research, uh, resources at this bit.ly link, bit.ly slash intolerable speech. And uh, it, you can see some more stuff on Twitter at Frameshift LLC. If you're live tweeting this talk, thank you very much. Please uh, tag Frameshift LLC instead of my personal account. Thanks. All right, so I just, I'm gonna set the scene with uh, reviewing the common US approach to free speech. And I'm talking about the, the general common knowledge or how people think about it. And it can be summarized in this way uh, with these words, I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. And that's uh, Evelyn Beatrice Hall describing Voltaire's beliefs, right? So there's an interesting problem here. What if the people whose right to speech uh, you are defending actually want you to be dead? That this is their goal, they want to kill you, and that makes you happy that you're dying defending their speech. Well, <laughs> uh, back in 2003, The Onion took on this kind of problem with this approach to free speech in a joke satirical newspaper article entitled ACLU, American Civil Liberties Union, defends Nazis' rights to burn down ACLU headquarters, right? Uh, the Nazis would like for the ACLU to not exist anymore. Um, all right, great, excellent. <laughs> Somehow appropriate. <laughs> um, now uh, we fast forward to 2017, uh, and it's looking more and more like actual reality. The ACLU did defend the rights of people with actual Nazi flags to march um, in Charlottesville, and they carried torches. They threatened to light people on fire. Uh, they beat people, uh, they injured dozens, and they actually murdered uh, a, a person, as we all know. Uh, so this is <laughs> an actual real problem, something that was a joke in 2003, we are concerned about being reality. Even worse than that, uh, our president responded by saying that there were fine people on both sides of this violence. Uh, and various other uh, various other comments which seem to be supporting white supremacists. And as a result, about 37% of the people polled thought that his response was either somewhat appropriate or uh, very appropriate. So this is a new world we are finding ourselves in. Um, the, it's so new and different that the ACL did actually change its policy after Charlottesville. Uh, this is what Anthony Romero, the executive director of the ACLU has to say. If a protest group insists, no, we want to be able to carry loaded firearms, well, we don't have to represent them. They can find someone else. Keep in mind, the ACLU has been defending Nazis since 1934. Uh, this is an enormous change to make for this organization. I'm sorry. Oh, I can't explain why the ACLU is supporting Nazis, they, but there's lots of articles about why they do it. They have a theory. <laughs> Um, so what I want to talk about is what this means for tech companies uh, and tech workers in particular, everyone here. Uh, the outline of this talk is I'll first talk about what the paradox of tolerance is, then I'm going to uh, go over my proposed intolerable speech rule. It's proposed because I'm hoping you'll improve it. Uh, I'm going to talk about examples of tech companies taking action based on the paradox of tolerance, just to show, that, just to show nobody's alone in this. A lot of people are doing it now. Uh, and I'll talk about how to implement the paradox of tolerance at your company. So uh, David told you a little bit about this, but I'll repeat for the people who won't get the introduction. I was a software engineer specializing in the Linux kernel and file systems for over 10 years, um, at which point I got tired of being treated in a sexist way. <laughs> and I co-founded and was ex executive director of the Ada Initiative, uh, which supported women in uh, open source software, Wikipedia, and things like that. I founded Frameshift Consulting, which is a diversity and inclusion and technology consulting company here in San Francisco. As part of that, I teach the Ally Skills Workshop, which teaches people with more privilege and power how to support people with less privilege and power. I've taught it to over 1,900 people in eight countries at this point. 
Uh, more relevant to this topic, uh, it was interesting digging up things I was proud of. Um, Breitbart News wrote about me in 2015, back when most people had never heard of it. <laughs> uh, they said that I was trying to frame Linus Torvalds for sexual assault. Uh, no, I wasn't. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'm just proud that they wrote a, a scurrilous, hateful, wrong article about me back then. Uh, starting around in 2016, I, I started doing a number of other things uh, around politics. One of the things I started doing is tweeting using my company account about politics in mid-2016. Uh, I, uh, After the election, I started I organized the um, co-organized the Never Again Tech Pledge, where over 2,800 tech workers took a pledge not to support uh, human rights abuses with their work. I wrote uh, a post explaining how to change people's hearts and minds and your families and friends uh, who might have bigoted or intolerant opinions. I went on marches and made protest signs. I called my representatives. I donated thousands of dollars. I did all of the things. Uh, one of the things I did is I studied fascism. I read these books and many others and many other um, uh, sources of information on both the rise of fascism and the, the situations in which fascism was thwarted before it could come to full flower. And that's where I learned about the paradox of tolerance. So the paradox of tolerance is actually just a rule with one exception, but paradox makes it sound cooler. So. Uh, the, Paradox is, a tolerant society should be tolerant by default, except with one exception, it should not tolerate intolerance itself. So there's a great Wikipedia page you can send to people or look, look for more details on it. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit more about it. Um, so it was, uh, this is a graph of deaths by country in World War II, both in absolute numbers of millions and the percentage of the total uh, population. The paradox of tolerance was formulated in 1945 at the end of World War II by Karl Popper. This is absolutely no coincidence uh, because we just ha went through a situation in which being too tolerant um, put us in a situation of having a gigantic world war. Uh, we, when we tolerated Mussolini uh, it invading Ethiopia and said, hey, you know what, they're intolerant, they're terrible, but if we just give them this, they'll stop and be satisfied. Uh, we made a big mistake. Same thing happened with Hitler annexing various places around Germany. We said, okay, he'll be happy once he has this and we'll stop. This was known as appeasement. You can also call it being tolerant of intolerance. Um, another way to look at it is that a tolerant society has a right to self-defense. If the tolerant societies had not fought back against intolerance, um, they would have been wiped from the face of the earth there would be no tolerant society, right? So if you want there to be tolerance, it must defend itself, and sometimes that means being intolerant. All right, so hopefully that's enough on what can be a, a tricky issue, uh, but that's the paradox of tolerance. So let's look about what, uh, what it looks like in practice. Uh, and I'll start here with the European Convention on Human Rights. It says, everyone has the right to freedom of expression. The exercise of these freedoms may be subject to such formalities, conditions, restrictions, or penalties as are prescribed by law and are necessary in a democratic society for the protection of the reputation or rights of others. And in particular, the, pr the protection of the rights of others is important here. Um, so an example of this is uh, laws against denying the Holocaust. The idea here is that the Holocaust was such a terrible event that we can't risk debating the facts of how it happened because if, or whether it was important. Because we, if we lose that information, if we lose that knowledge, we could repeat it, right? So that's, uh, there are laws against denying the Holocaust in around 17 countries. Most of them are located in Europe um, or were heavily affected by World War II. Uh, that would be Russia. Uh, with the exception of the country that was created in part by the Holocaust, which is Israel. So there's some sort of uh, experience with this, uh, with the Holocaust that led people to say, we need to restrict speech in this particular way. Um, so here's a, a more down to earth everyday example. And also I, it's not a, it's not a Valerie Aurora talk unless I have a tweet from Jen Schiffer in it. So uh, Jen Schiffer is a software engineer, artist and uh, humorist. And she tweets, a very easy and fun activity is not letting people use your racist software or your software for racist garbage. This is a very important thing to bring up when talking to future current employers. What's your stance on Nazis using your product? Right. So just as an individual software developer, you can say, hey, you know what? I'm not going to support people who are white supremacists. That's just my choice. 
Um, so let's talk about tech companies and freedom of speech and sort of this, this what was the norm maybe a few years ago and which is becoming less and less the norm. So historically, a lot of people would approach the, the topic of what content to, to host uh, as just support all speech as long as it's not actually literally illegal, uh, if it's not spam, um, or if it's not directly harming the service. Uh, a bunch of companies will say that they have uh, rules against harassment and abuse on their platforms, but that's pretty indifferently implemented. So I won't put it, I won't include it as totally common. Uh, one of the issues we suffer from when we talk about free speech in tech companies and what, how that affects our decision what to host is something called legal talisman syndrome. So this is coined by the lawyer uh, Kendra Albert. Albert. And uh, a legal talisman is a ter legal term of art that's out of place. It's invoked to make or justify substantive decisions that don't involve formal legal process. Uh, so you're taking, oftentimes when you use the phrase free speech, you're bringing all of these connotations of, this, the, of a vast powerful government, right, which could greatly harm uh, things if it censors, and uh, this huge body of First Amendment law and very serious people arguing in suits in front of courts, right? And you're applying it to a private company making decisions about which clients to support. Right? These are two totally different situations, but through the, the magic of legal talisman, you can then get introduce a great deal of uncertainty and doubt. Um, it's so common that there's a meme that has been created with the concept that free speech is so meaningless if you say it over and over again, free speech, free speech, free speech, free speech you end up saying freeze peach, which is pro approximately as meaningful as free speech in the context it's being used. So this is a great uh, comic from Niche Stolen. Uh, let's see, now 100% nuance free, right? Like, it can't get complicated, just free speech, the end. So uh, I recommend looking that up, it's great. Uh, so here's a freeze peach example. This is Twitter in 2012. Uh, Tony Wang says, generally we remain neutral as to the content because our general counsel and CEO like to say that we are the free speech wing of the free speech party. To which I say, what? <laughs> You're not only the government, Twitter is the government, like we are like the government, but you also have parties and you're the good party and what is, he, what is even happening here? Like free speech doesn't have meaning in this context. It's a great example of freeze peach or legal talismans. Um, so there are totally legitimate concerns about free speech that do apply to individual private companies making decisions about which, which content to host. Governments do pressure com companies to censor their, uh, their work in ways that harm society. It's a thing to worry about. Uh, a lot of people express a concern, like how do I know I'm banning something because it's bad or if I'm banning it because I just personally am prejudiced against them because of the way I was, I was raised? Um, are you gonna have to re reverse your decision and look foolish? Uh, will users leave the service because we made a bad decision about what to host? Uh, are we are we actually harming society? This is a big question that people ask. So there's there's plenty of legitimate concerns there, but uh, taking away this sort of blanket freeze peach approach is really helpful. Um, so here's what Karl Popper has to say, and Karl Popper again is the the philosopher who uh, formulated the paradox of tolerance. He says, "I do not imply, for instance, that we should always suppress the utterance of intolerant ph philosophies." As long as we can counter them by rational argument and keep them in check by public opinion, suppression would certainly be unwise. So he's saying there's a lot of cases in which censorship or banning or, or suppressing speech is not the right answer. But here's what he goes on to say. But we should claim the right to suppress them, if necessary, even by force, for it may easily turn out that they are not prepared to meet us on the level of rational argument, but begin by denouncing all argument. They may forbid their followers to listen to rational argument because it is deceptive and teach them to answer arguments by the use of their fists or pistols. This is precisely what's happening today. What do you think fact, uh, fake news is, right? There, this is a, um, a, a form of intolerance and hate which is impervious to argument, to speech, to the usual methods of fighting bad ideas. And instead they're coming out and saying, you know what, we'll just load up our guns and we'll light our torches and we'll make, get our way by violence. So this is the situation that we're talking about here uh, when we're, we're talking about the paradox of uh, tolerance. So even the US Bill of Rights has something to say and I loved it, I love this quote um, from Waldo Jackwith, who is the former ACLU Virginia board member who resigned as a result of ACLU's, 
ACLU's decision to defend um, the white supremacists marching in Charlottesville. He says, the First Amendment guarantees the right of the people peaceably to assemble, peaceably. When it became clear that the organizer's goal was violence, that left me with no qualms about their lack of First Amendment rights in this matter. One more point I want to make here is that the level, level of tolerance changes with context. Uh, so here's a great thing from Susan Benesh, the director of the Dangerous Speech Project. She says, even in the US where we have the most speech protective law, some acts of speech are illegal. Nobody has suggested that to fulfill freedom of expression, every act of speech has to be allowed. It doesn't mean you can post absolutely anything. Everyone is figuring out how to draw the lines. And I like this, this idea that like we are, it is an ongoing process. There's no hard and fast rules and it changes depending on what's going on. So I would like to talk about tech companies that are actually using the paradox of tolerance. Uh, I made a spreadsheet uh, because that's what you do. If you go to bit.ly slash intolerable speech, you'll find the link for that. I've currently got 37 entries for 34 different companies, including heavyweights like uh, Apple, Google, Twitter, Uber even, uh, and of course, Airbnb, you all. So let's go into a few, few of these. Uh, so I'm gonna start with people who took action before Charlottesville, so I think that's only fair. Uh, October 27th, 2016, Airbnb created the community commitment for all hosts and guests. So it goes like this. I agree to treat everyone in the Airbnb community, regardless of their race, religion, national origin, ethnicity, disability, sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, or age, with respect and without judgment or bias, which came in handy on August 8th, still before Charlottesville, when Airbnb revoked the bookings and accounts for dozens of people attending the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. And here's the, the company statement. When through our background check processes or from input of our community, we, ident we identify and determine that there are those who would be pursuing behavior on the platform that would be antithetical to the Airbnb community commitment. We seek to take appropriate action, including as in this case, removing them from the platform. So this is a great you know, setup and then spike. Uh, Spotify took action before Charlottesville as well. Uh, they have for many, many years used a database of, of, of objectionable material maintained by the gov German government to proactively ban white supremacist material, so bans and things like that. They do other bans on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, and of a, as of November 2014, they'd already banned 22 of the 54 white supremacist bans listed by the Southern Poverty Law Center, and they were deleting more. Uh, after Charlottesville, they responded to additional requests to delete more obscure com uh, white supremacist content. And they said, uh, we are glad to have been alerted to this content and have already removed many of the bans identified today whilst urgently reviewing the remainder. Uh, so uh, Facebook took action before and after Charlottesville. Uh, they, on August 11th, they removed the organizing page for the Unite the Right rally, which was the day before it. And on the 14th afterwards, they deleted many more na white nationalist groups, pages, profiles, things like that. But I can't give them a ton of credit because they had uh, several warnings before that. 2016, the Southern Poverty Law Center let them know about uh, over 200 items. Uh, Facebook deleted fewer than 10. May 10th, Fast Company told them about 17 items. Facebook deleted two. July 31st, The Guardian told them about 175 items. They deleted nine, right? It took Charlottesville, it took frankly, a white woman being murdered uh, before they were willing to take this action. Uh, I just want to point out the moral of the story here. If the Southern Poverty Law Center reaches out to you and says there's a problem with the content on your site, you should listen to them because they're the experts. Uh, uh, an example from a company that's proactively doing this, uh, Bumble is an online dating website or a dating, dating service similar to Tinder, but with a, a pro-woman slant. It was founded, co-founded by Whitney Wolf, who experienced being sexually harassed and discriminated against uh, as a co-founder of Tinder. So as an explicitly pro-woman service, they experienced a lot of attacks motivated by misogyny. So they were aware bad people are out there and they need to do something about it. And they extended that into uh, hate symbols, uh, being very proactive about finding and removing profiles with hate symbols, uh, especially white supremacist hate symbols. So after Charlottesville, they formally partnered with the Anti-Defamation League, which maintains an up-to-date database of the latest symbols. So they could, keep, they could stay ahead of the curve. Uh, after Charlottesville, uh, here's an, uh, WordPress, which is run by the company Automatic. Um, in, before Charlottesville, they were asked by Fast Company, why are you hosting all of these white supremacist sites? And their answer was, we censor nothing. If it's legal, we put it up. 
August 15th, they deleted American Vanguard without further explanation. American Vanguard is the group uh, th that James Fields claimed membership in, the alleged murderer in Charlottesville. So not exactly covering themselves in glory, but they did it. I just want to say something about terms of service versus enforcement. So as I went through and collected this database, I noticed that most companies didn't change their terms of service. They just changed the way that they enforce them. And this is totally fine. It's normal to have a public facing document and then a much more detailed, much more quickly changing set of internal guidelines. Uh, what's important is to keep those up to date and actually put in the effort to enforce them. Uh, so you can check out the various uh, forms that terms of services use to uh, ban this kind of hate speech and uh, hateful content. Um, and I just want to note that <laughs> while Amazon has an extremely explicit ban that covers white supremacist content, they are taking no action before or after Charlottesville to remove white supremacist content. Um, so I want to talk about a few examples that weren't based on the paradox of tolerance. Uh, Cloudflare on August 16th, uh, uh, it's a company that provides protection against denial of service attacks. The Daily Stormer, which is a white supremacist website, had an account with them. Um, they terminated it, terminated it on August 16th, and the leaked internal email said, literally, I woke up in a bad mood and decided someone shouldn't be allowed to you on the internet. Uh, no one should have that power. Uh, and I do sympathize with this and agree, you shouldn't be making decisions about who is allowed to be on the internet based on being in a bad mood. And I have a proposal for making that decision based on other things. Um, here's another non-paradox of tolerance example. Uh, Dreamhost, Dreamhost's official policy is we will host any website as long as its content is legal in the United States of America. Uh, on August 24th, uh, after uh, the Daily Stormer had lost its denial of service protection, uh, Dreamhost terminated Daily Stormer's account for basically being the target of a denial of service attack. Uh, I don't think that's a great way to make this kind of decision is it's unpopular and people are doing denial of services because plenty of positive things uh, get denial of services, service attacks. All right, so um, I just wanted to give you another freeze peach reminder. Uh, I actually was given a little freeze peach model and I'll pass it around the audience. My friend Gretchen Koch made it and there's if you look in the slides, you can find out more about it. Uh, freeze peach. Think of it next time somebody just says that with no context. All right, so here's my proposed rule, and I'm calling it the intolerable ad, intolerable speech rule. Um, it's probably gonna undergo some more revisions, but here's the basics, and I'll go over each element. Uh, I suggest that you ban people from using your products if they are advocating for the removal of human rights from people based on an aspect of their identity in the context of systemic oppression, primarily harming that group in a way that overall increases the danger to that group. So we'll go over each one and then we'll do a few examples. Um, so the advocating for the removal of human rights, this covers a lot of things. It includes like the right to not just live, but vote, travel, uh, get medical care, uh, this includes speech. There's a bunch of things in this in this realm. I, ca I count dehumanizing or treating a group as inferior, categorically, uh, as meeting this criteria because humans don't need human rights, right? You have to be human first. Uh, many tech companies, uh, terms of service already forbid, uh, and they usually use the words promoting, advocating, or encouraging violence or hate of this form. So that's relatively uncontroversial. Uncontro controversial. Um, from people based on an aspect of their identity. So it has to be based or, or rooted in um, a judgment on a person based on a part of their identity. That's something that's difficult to change. So it's something like race or gender or sexuality or disability. Um, religion is interesting because parts of it you do not need to respect, the intolerant parts. This is part of the paradox of tolerance. Um, just to be super clear, it's not part of your identity. Your, your, your intolerant or bigoted opinions are not part of your identity, and it's okay <laughs> to uh, treat people differently based on that. Um, in general, it's, it's f according to this rule, it's fine to ad advocate removing rights from people based on things they actually did or they freely chose. So we feel as a society, it's reasonable that someone convicted of murder may lose their ability to travel as they are in prison, that sort of thing. There's limits, there's details, I don't take that too far, but that's just explaining that. So three, in the context of systemic oppression, primarily harming that group. So, and, and this is really like not somebody says so on the internet, but there, people have done studies and they've run tests and they have concluded there is systemic oppression. Um, so as an example, systemic sexism hurts everyone, uh, it's true, 
but it hurts women and non-binary people more than it hurts men. So you can't get, out, get away with like, patriarchy hurts men too, so don't say anything mean about men. Um, and I'll give some more examples later on. Uh, there's plenty of reliable research out there. Uh, people are often saying like, well, who, who is systemically oppressed? I'm like, it's not actually rocket science. <laughs> um, the, difficult, the difficulty comes if you believe that you have to convince the person you're banning that they aren't part of an oppressed group. You don't, you only have to convince yourself. So do that. All right, that overall increases the danger to that group. So as Karl Popper said, a lot of speech is better off if you let it go out there and then you just treat it the normal way with like other people responding to that speech, right? Criticism and all that. Um, and there's some, some hate speech that makes the target group safer. And here's some examples. Quoting hate speech in order to denounce it. Uh, providing material on hate speech for those studying hate groups. Uh, publishing private communications of hate groups in order to embarrass them or ruin their, or their um, organization, right? Um, so there's, there's a way to say like, hey, we can allow this content because it's making the world better. Um, so I'm just gonna give you a few examples. Uh, so say a famous black person tweeted, maybe white people shouldn't vote for 10 years, just take a break. I, th I argue, according to this rule, that you should allow that kind of speech. Um, first, it doesn't meet number three. There's no content. There's no, white people's votes are safe. <laughs> That's not gonna change. There's no danger of that. Um, and in reality, this is a joke meant to raise the awareness of how normalized it is that there are people sitting in rooms right now trying to figure out how to suppress the vote of people of color. Powerful people who are succeeding in doing it, right? Um, so this, this is the kind of speech you would allow on your platform. Um, here's another example you, I would, that doesn't meet this rule. Uh, Wall Street Journal op-ed suggesting that Democrats should not be allowed to vote. So being a Democrat is not part of your identity. Uh, so it doesn't meet number two, because um, you, you can choose your political opinions. But you would, might want to suppress this speech for other reasons like um, believing that universal su suffrage is really important or wanting to protect your newspaper's reputation, right? So this isn't the only rule, it's just one of many rules. Uh, here's another case that doesn't meet the test. The Fast Company reporter in an interview with the Cloudflare CEO said, if I were to write on my blog, I think Cloudflare is homophobic and that's good because I hate gays. That puts you in the same position that you were with the Daily Stormer, right? Uh, so equating like this little tiny random blog with a powerful hate, hate site for white supremacy. I would say it doesn't meet number four. This is the kind of thing that you can have a normal, uh, a, a normal response of other people criticizing your little tiny blog. Maybe, maybe not, but um, I would say not. Uh, all right, and here's one more example. People posting the Daily Stormer article attacking Heather Heyer on Facebook with comments denouncing it. I would say number four, it doesn't increase the overall danger to the group and actually um, it helps because a whole bunch of people were expressing disgust. Facebook also made this exception. So this is not the only test, it's one of many. You should keep using all your other tests, but it covers a really bad loophole that a lot of companies have. All right, just another free speech. This one by my friend Stephanie Zvon. Uh, the little subtitle saying, not sure what it is, but it's mine. You know, this vague idea, like vague, I have um, something that makes whatever I'm doing okay. So I like that. All right, so we're close to the end here. Uh, implementing the paradox of tolerance. Here's some. Uh, here's the basics of it. Uh, update your terms of service if necessary. You'd be surprised how often that isn't necessary. There's a lot of language out there already. Uh, continuously update your enforcement guidelines, uh, in, including proactively seeking out evolving threats. So not just waiting until you notice or somebody else points it out to you. A really important part of this is having a diverse and empowered team that's not only implementing the terms of service, but also creating the guidelines, the enforcement guidelines and the terms of service. So there needs to be power and feedback going on there. Uh, and you should listen to and partner with experts. There are people who uh, founded whole nonprofits to study these kinds of things. They're experts, they want to help you. They're often willing to do it for free, so do that. Um, so I just wanna go into a few details around this. Uh, legal issues people sometimes are worried about, as always, ask your lawyer if you have a, a real legal concern. I just wanna point out that in many cases, the law is actually supportive of implementing the paradox of tolerance. Examples, um, there's anti-discrimination laws for how you pr provide law lodging in the United States. Sure helps if you don't have a bunch of um, white supremacist hate speech in your users' profiles, right? I'm sure that will help that. Uh, anti-harassment or anti-stalking laws, if you're not helping people do those things. Uh, and non-US laws tend far more towards restricting speech. In fact, Twitter has like a special uh, Holocaust denial mode that in countries where that law is active, it just won't show certain Twitter accounts. 
why can't you do that for all the countries? Oh, I don't know. Okay. So um, structural issues. There's a good question here. Uh, this is a question the Cloudflare CEO is asking. Why are tech companies making these decisions? It's a good question. Uh, it's not a great situation that we're in that tech companies have this kind of power. Um, he was saying, and many others, would rather that there were clear legal limits and they could just implement those and they would be fine. Um, many countries do have better laws, including most of the EU, um, but the laws will always lag or be out of step and we'll have to be willing to take action ourselves. So we need to stay ahead of that and still do what we can wh where we can. All right, so advice on advocating for change at your company. Um, so Liz Fong Jones has a really great summary of how she led several campaigns to change company policy at Google, the gigantic, uh, very important company. You can find that on my blog. Uh, you can also hire me or I would suggest Yvonne Hutchinson at ReadySet to help you with uh, implementing these sort of things. But here's some, here's some arguments you can use depending on what works for the person you're talking to. I don't necessarily agree with all of these or think they are good arguments. They're just arguments that sometimes work. So hosting hate groups is bad for the brand. <laughs> uh, that was one of the things that the Cloudflare CEO talked about. It was like, we don't want to be the denial of service protection company for white supremacists. Like that's not a, no, that won't help us. Um, hate groups are just bad clients. <laughs> they are unethical, they are cheap. They are mean, they're just jerks. Nobody likes working with them. It's just miserable. Um, fascism overall is bad for business as it mobilizes the entire economic output of a nation for the purpose of going to war. So I suggest that you help prevent it. Uh, it's harder to recruit and retain employees if you ha host a bunch of hateful groups on your service. People just don't wanna do that. They don't wanna work for a company that does it and that's not how they wanna spend their days. Uh, it reduces your legal exposure because frankly, hate groups do illegal things. They want to kill people and uh, do many other bad things. So it's helpful. Uh, personal arguments. You can stop feeling bad about your job and sleep better at night. Uh, you like living in a free society. Uh, you care about fairness and justice. Your friends might start avoiding you if you work for a company that supports hate groups. And this is totally a real concern, yeah. Um, random arguments. I don't, these, uh, these are terrible, but if they work, use it. Uh, everyone else is doing it. Uh, I, I, now you can give them a spreadsheet, at least 34 other tech companies with big names. Karl Popper and a bunch of other old white male philosophers say that this is the right thing to do. If you think that's a good argument, go for it. Uh, and World War II is what happens when people are tolerant of intolerance. We could skip that this time. That would be great. All right, so here's the call to action. Um, please tell other people about the paradox of tolerance. The wiki page is great. There's other options. I keep thinking about making business cards with the paradox of tolerance printed on them. Uh, organize other tech workers at your company to ad adopt the intolerable speech rule at your company. Ask your legislators to pass laws that take the paradox of tolerance into account. Let me tell you, the, the US anti-discrimination law is on terrible footing. Uh, it would be really nice to improve this. And finally, uh, donate to the Southern Poverty Law Center. That's something you can do right now. They're doing great work. They're amazing. Um, and you should support it. All right, that's it. Thanks. I appreciate it.